Our first keynote speaker, uh, she's a real futurist and a digital creativity specialist. Sarah Brin is head of product and growth at Kythera AI. I hope I pronounced it correctly, Kythera. And her talk is called, Can I, I Be Creative? So that's probably the, the ultimate question. Is artificial intelligence the tool for innovation or maybe also a threat for creative people? Please welcome to the stage, Sarah Brin. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out this morning. Thank you for streaming online. I'm Sarah Brin. Um, I'm going to get right into it. I'm going to talk about uh, our presentation today in four parts. And as our lovely hostess mentioned, my presentation today is called Can AI Be Creative? So we're going to start by giving you a little bit of background on me and my work in the creative industries. I'm talking about why AI is something really important to talk about right now. Uh, um, followed by what is creativity anyways, and we'll talk about a couple different definitions of how people understand and apply creativity uh, in professional and artistic contexts. And then I'll wrap up with talking about uh, what the future is for AI in games. So first of all, why am I here? Uh, as it was mentioned, I work at Kythera AI, where I'm head of product and growth. Kythera AI is a middleware tool set for game studios to speed up their development processes. We do this by providing solutions for quickly creating intelligent NPCs, non-playable characters, that understand and react to their environments. But before that, uh, and in my consulting work, I've been a digital creativity specialist, and I've worked across disciplines for about 15 years. And I specialize in bringing playful, creative technology experiences to life, including my work co-founding Play SF MoMA, the artist games program at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which focuses on the collection, exhibition, and research around artist-made games. I also led creative programs at the Digital Fabrication Workshop for uh, Autodesk in San Francisco at Pier 9, where I worked with a broad range of artists, designers, fabricators to push the limits of Autodesk's software and hardware technology, which included 3D printers, CNC machines, laser cutters, and of course, industrial robot arms. And not too long after that, I moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I worked for the digital and immersive entertainment and experience design company, Meow Wolf. Meow Wolf is a company that's backed by George R. R. Martin of Game of Thrones. And what I did there is I worked with a range of different creative technology partners and a team of interdisciplinary creative technologists to build immersive storytelling tech. And one of the projects that we did includes Omega Mart, which is a phys physical, fully hands-on exhibition in Las Vegas, Nevada. And it is an extraordinary supermarket that bursts into surreal worlds and unexpected landscapes that visitors can explore by going through various portals in the store. I also built out Rolls-Royce's arts programs, and most recently, I worked with Sony on their project at Media Molecule Dreams, which is a groundbreaking engine for digital creativity, visual programming, and user-generated content. And while I was at Dreams, I got to work on some really cool projects, including work with these partners, which included short films, music videos, live streams, game jams, and all kinds of really cool stuff. OK. So I've worked in physical environment spaces, in museums, with all kinds of different types of creative technology, hardware. Um, why do I care about AI? So if you've paid attention to anything over the past year or so, you might have noticed that AI is everywhere. Um, so why do we need to talk about it right now? Well, if we take a look at the past 12 months, it's been a really busy year for AI. And actually, if you look at March, that in and of itself was a really, really busy month for AI. Um, and uh, particularly generative AI, we have Stable Diffusion coming out in August of 2022, followed by ChatGPT3, uh, MidJourney, ChatGPT4, uh, Microsoft launching Copilot 365, 
followed by the statement on AI risk in May 30th of this year. And simultaneously, over a very similar period, we see some major layoffs at tech companies, some of the largest since the beginning of the pandemic. And of course, right as we speak, there are significant strikes going on in the United States related to the Writers Guild and the Screen Actors Guild, uh, who are on strike in part because of the threat AI poses to their creative livelihoods. And we know that these concerns aren't just limited to film and TV, they're creeping into the game sector as well. And depending on where you sit in the games industry, AI might appear like a threat to your creative livelihood. It might seem like an opportunity to save money and time in your production process. Or it might seem like an exciting possibility to transform the way you make games. And this poses some questions, right? Specifically, can AI be creative? Um, and when I say AI, of course, that stands for artificial intelligence. Artificial means created by a machine. Intelligence means a lot of different things depending on who you ask. But in this instance, I'll talk about the ability to perform tasks or solve problems. There are a lot of different kinds of AI. Generative AI is the type of AI that's been in the news most recently. So that's like your mid journeys or chat GPT-3s, your stable diffusions. Um, but also, there are other types of AI that have existed for decades. A lot of that AI it can include the AI you see in games, um, things like reactive machines, limited memory AI, theory of mind AI. Uh, well, theory of mind AI is very nascent. But, um, and there are other types of AI that hasn't really been proven in real life yet. OK, so now that I've gotten that part out of the way, what is creativity? Um, first, I'd like to start by saying what creativity isn't. Creativity isn't something only special people are born with. It's not the kind of thing where you have it or you don't. Um, oh, no, this happened to my fonts. Uh, creative, uh, creativity is a human skill, and it's like a muscle. You exercise it over time, and it gets stronger. Um, but it's, it's definitely not a thing only special people have. Uh, all humans have the capability to be creative, um, some animals as well. Uh, but um, creativity is a human trait. I also want to make it very clear that creativity doesn't mean being good at art. There are lots of different ways to be creative. Uh, and I hear all the time people are saying, oh, I'm not creative. Um, I think most of the time that just means people don't feel confident in their drawing or painting skills. But really, you can be creative in the ways you build software. You can be creative in the ways you make a sandwich. You can be creative in the way you lead a team. So there's all kinds of different creativity that we'll talk about. So in my research, I looked at research done by folks in the field of creativity studies, computer science, art, art history, design, and I looked at a bunch of scholars' definitions of creativity. And ultimately, I broke out these criteria into five different categories that we'll go through. Um, no one of these criteria are mutually exclusive, and more often than not, a particular project will uh, qualify under a couple different criteria. So the first, and maybe the most straightforward, is historical creativity. Historical creativity is the idea of when you are the first person in the history of time to come up with an idea. So it's 2023. We don't see a lot of historical creativity anymore. Um, but maybe if you were the first person to invent a wheel um, or to use fire to cook food, those are some great examples of historic creativity. Um, I'd, category I'm very partial to is relational creativity. And now what relational creativity, these types of um, criteria are about how creative people relate to other people or ideas. Um, and so if we take a look at re relational creativity, we see some of those qualities being contextual improvisation. So that's the idea of yes and, and building on to your collaborators' ideas. Combinational creativity, making unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas, challenging foundational assumptions or forms about particular topics of genres, and analogical thinking, so like drawing comparisons from one thing to another. 
Um, I included on my slides an example that I really like of combinational creativity, and that's the Barbie Liberation Organization by the Yes Men. And in this project, which took place in 1993, uh, these artists wanted to critique the gendered nature of both G.I. Joe and Barbie toys. And so what they did is they got a bunch of these dolls and they swapped the voice boxes and put them back into the store. So while unsuspecting purchasers would take these dolls home, they'd open up their Barbie and the Barbie would say things like, take the Jeep and get some ammo. And G.I. Joe would say things like, math is hard. Um, and I think that's a wonderful example of combinational creativity because you're mixing things up and getting different types of outcomes. Um, situational creativity, adapting to constraints and limitations. So we talk about constraints in, in creativity studies a lot, and uh, a great example of this is Henri Matisse's scissor paintings. So later in his life, when the famous painter Henri Matisse became very sick, too ill to paint, he decided to create what he called scissor paintings, in which he cut out forms uh, of colored paper and then applied them to canvas, which ended up becoming a new form of image making. Moving on to psychological creativity, uh, which is ideas of, uh, about creativity related to the self, which includes the ability to, and others, the ability to produce a high volume of ideas, so that's to, to brainstorm not being precious with your ideas, so letting ideas come and go, understanding that there will continue to be a wealth of creative ideas that come to you. Uh, novelty, so it's new to the person having the idea, so that's gonna be the opposite of, or different than, that idea of historical creativity. Uh, also, resisting dichotomous thinking and embracing complexity. Um, I think if we take that into consideration, a lot of arguments on the internet are not very creative. <laughs> uh, and of course, reflective criti self-criticism, the ability to critique and analyze yourself and your own work and understand the roles your own bias uh, plays in uh, your project is another kind of form of creativity. And the last category is subjective creativity. Um, now, this is creativity that is contingent on context, values, and who's interpreting it. So uh, that could be ideas or artifacts that are surprising. What is surprising? That's going to be completely dependent on who you are, where you are, when you are. Similarly, ideas or artifacts that are valu valuable. There's different types of value. Uh, so that can be monetary value, personal value, but again, what is valuable is completely subjective and can vary from person to person. Okay, so what if we consider all of these criteria and then we apply them to AI tools? And what I realized while doing the course of this research is it wasn't really a question of if AI is created or not, um, it's just, one part of a multi-step creative process. So I looked at these different tools, including uh, Ubisoft Ghostwriter, uh, Blizzard Diffusion, and some other internal uh, game AI tools, and I wasn't really surprised by my findings. However, during the process of looking at these different tools, understanding what AI does well, and understanding what human creativity is, I did find some interesting tensions and overlaps um, between creativity and AI. The first of which is the concept of theft. So there's this artist and author that I really like, and his name is Austin Kleon. And he's written a bunch of different books, including a book called Steal Like an Artist. Um, and this is from that book. And so in that book, he talks about the importance of being inspired by and borrowing from other people's work. And as you can see here, he lays out the difference between kind of good types of theft and bad types of theft. And he talks about the process of often when we're early in our creative careers, we start off by mimicking people or creators that we admire. But often through the process of our own human infallibility, that ability to replicate doesn't copy over 100%. So what we end up being is something completely different and that's how we end up finding our own creative voices. Generative AI is very good at stealing, and it's very good at remixing pre-existing things to come up with new stuff. But 
unfortunately, a lot of the time, credit to and consent from these artists are missing. So if we take, for example, Greg Rakowski's work, you might have seen Greg Rakowski's work in Magic the Gathering, um, Horizon Forbidden West, or Dungeons and Dragons. And according to the MIT Review of Technology, Greg Rakowski's work is more frequently queried from Stable Diffusion than Pablo Picasso. It's one of the most frequently searched for terms on Stable Diffusion. So if you look at the, that, that image right there, that is an image created by Stable Diffusion with the prompt to copy Greg Rakowski. And if you look at the other image, the kind of bluish image, that's Rakowski's work. So um, obviously he's very concerned. He didn't consent for his work to be sampled in this way. Uh, and he's quite worried, understandably, that his style will become more you artworks created in his style will become more ubiquitous than the artwork he's actually created. So what do we do about this? So this is a toolkit I really, really like. This is just one part of it. And it provides some really great examples for how to more ethically source training data. And I really like that it talks about the, uh, the process of creating data sets as curation. So being really deliberate about the data sets you're putting together, monitoring, monitoring for different types of bias, but also being very careful and thorough to check, like, am I using copywritten material? Is this Creative Commons or not? To think about um, the issues of consent. Is the artist still alive? Um, and it, this seems essential to me for sustaining the future of creatives in all kinds of industries. Um, I also really like a lot about the proposed EU AI Act for this reason. Uh, what it does is it clumps different types of AI into different types of risk categories. And when it comes to generative AI, there is a proposition for companies to disclose what their data sets are trained on and whether or not copywritten material is part of that data set. Uh, the second thing I, I mentioned when, or I noticed that with, when studying the overlaps between creativity, strengths, and AI, uh, is that different types of AI can be really good at repetitive tasks. Whether it's a rehearsal, or a first draft, or a prototype, uh, many creative professions involve a multi-step process. And AI can often assist with parts of this process. So, for example, if you look like at a tool like Kythera, it can easily complete tasks for game designers like automatic cover markup, generating navigational mesh, and NPC behavior trees. Um, if you've done this by hand yourself, you might know that this kind of work can be extremely time consuming. And part of why studios like working with tools like this is because it allows them to spend less time on repetitive tasks and more time on focusing on building expansive worlds, big stories, and immersive gameplay experiences. And the third and final concept I want to talk about is fun. Um, if any of you are in or know folks who work in the game studies sector, you might know that game academics hate the word fun. Uh, and that's because it's impossible to accurately describe what fun is. Uh, as illustrated by this cool uh, drawing by Raf Koster, um, in his book, A Theory of Fun, in which he illustrates there's so many different types of fun. And that fun, thinking about the value of creativity, it is also very, very subjective. Um, and because fun and funniness are so hard to define, um, that's part of why AI is pretty bad at knowing what's fun or funny. I will illustrate this for you by telling you a terrible joke. Um, so, I asked, in preparation of this talk, for ChatGPT3 to help me write some jokes for uh, an audience of game industry people about AI. <laughs> so get ready for uh, a not funny joke. Okay, why, <laughs> why did the AI refuse to play hide and seek? Because it thought everyone should just use Control F. Bad. <laughs> Bad news. I'm going to tell you another one. Uh, why was the computer cold at night? Because it left the windows open. <laughs> Sorry, ChatGPT. Not this time. And what this really drove home for me 
is that AI is just one of many creative tools, and when they work well, it's usually part of a multi-step process. I've said this a few times. At least at this moment in time and in history, you really need a human designer or multiple designers who really understand what's fun and who understand play. So, which led me to the question, can AI play with humans in creative ways? So, I think probably most of us are familiar with the concept of NPCs in games. Um, humans have been playing with AI NPCs in games for a very long time. Um, but how else can we use AI to deliver play experiences that are novel, compelling, and genuinely fun? And this reminded me of Hans-Jörg Gadamer's theory of play, or the play of art, which he describes as a dialogue between audience and content, or an artwork, or in this case, audience and game, so a back and forth process. Um, and I have a couple of examples of games that use AI to really embrace that back and forth with players to create that kind of play. Uh, the first being a project called How Not to Get Hit by a Self-Driving Car. And I'm gonna play a short video for you. Our project, How Not to Get Hit by a Self-Driving Car, is a street-based game that challenges the public to avoid being detected in the eye of an AI. So what we have planned is a space which is decorated using different forms of street furniture, traffic equipment, such as cones and other sort of barriers. We'll have a start button and a start line. From there, you'll be able to see the goal button on the other side. There'll also be a huge LED truck, which will be displaying the playing field at all times, so players will be able to see themselves. And basically, players will push the start button and the experience will begin, and they'll essentially just need to try to get to the goal without being detected by the AI. So they must disguise themselves or run and hide and find any way to trick the AI to hit that goal button. We so I love this project because uh, not only does it kind of perform the dual function of educating audiences about what AI is, but it's also extremely fun. And it's so interesting to me that AI is the mechanic itself. Um, and what's really interesting about this game is if you win, it means in real life the AI wouldn't have detected you and you would have been hit by a car. And also, subsequently, you're training the AI to recognize you or whatever you were just doing in the future, which I just think is complex and brilliant and fun. Um, oh, no. Uh, this is an, another project called Bad News, and Bad News is an award-winning installation work that combines novel AI technologies and live improvisational acting into an interactive experience whose story and setting is uniquely generated by a computer simulation every single playthrough. Each 45-minute performance is an original work of immersive theater produced for an audience or one, or one, of, one or two people at a time. So what I think is absolutely wild about this is that if you look at um, the person at the computer right there, that's the person running the simulation. And in addition to running the simulation, he's on chat with that actor. So he's feeding information to the actor in real time. If you look at those two players, they, their only UI, they're, they're not looking at a screen, their only UI is the actor there. So I, what I love is this kind of translation process between the computational nature of the simulation itself being kind of translated or um, just communicated through the actor. And what I also really like is that it's a unique playthrough every time. You can never play the game, same game twice. And also, there's no barrier to entry when it comes to understanding how to use different types of controllers because it's just human interaction as the interface. Um, and the last project I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show um, another really quick video to explain.
So um, the sound designer for this project is Maxi Bach. Um, and kind of similar to bad news, the soundtrack which responds to the player in real time is never the same twice. And it, what it does, it cr kind of re creates this responsive soundtrack by using a machine learning technology called a variational auto encoder, encoder neural network. Maxi just developed an algorithm to follow macro control of pattern selection based on parameters like intensity, density, and similarity. So this is trained on thousands, I believe, of, of different kind of MIDI um, samples, which I just think is just so fun. Um, so what became abundantly clear to me after looking at this games and embarking upon this research is that creativity is in the interplay, the back and forth between humans and their tools. So what does that mean? Uh, and what is next for the future of AI and games? We need to continue to cultivate human creativity in a world that coexists with AI. And in order to do that, we need to protect and promote human creativity as technology, technology changes. Um, and luckily, we have a few precedents for this. This is what an illuminated manuscript looks like. This used to be how the written word got communicated. As you can see, it's beautifully hand-rendered. Um, I included that image with the pretzels because we are in Germany. This is one of the first uh, renderings of pretzels in an illuminated manuscript. Um, and of course, this all changed. In 1439, Gutenberg invented the printing press, which meant that more people could access the printed word. It was cheaper to produce, and it, this technology changed the world forever. Another example is the idea of uh, the transition from painting to photography. Painters used to believe that the mission of their work was to be a window to the world, to paint the world as the eye would see it. And when photography, specifically the daguerreotype, was invented, uh, painters said, oh, painting is dead. Painting wasn't dead, but what it did is that new technology pushed artists to innovate in their fields, which drew them towards abstraction, expressionism, creating kind of more expressive paintings that were less about rendering like realistic or real life experiences and things that were more personal and subjective. Okay, so what is different about this moment in time? Um, everything with AI, especially generative AI, is happening really, really fast, but this doesn't have to be at human expense. We can have technological innovation, but we don't need to leave people behind in the ways that major TV and movie studios are proposing to. We can do this by building stronger safety nets and organizing workers to come together to support each other and to speak out about concerns and best practices in our industry. I'm very close to the end of my talk, but let's quickly recap. This is a crucial moment for AI and its rapid development. There are many different types of AI, some of which have been used for decades. Our understanding of creativity encompasses historical, situational, psychological, relational, and subjective factors. AI tools have creative utility, and major improvements need to be made to how we curate data sets. AI can be deployed to minimize creative tasks, or rather repetitive tasks. AI currently at this particular moment is not particularly good at understanding what's fun or funny. And a back and forth process with humans can yield really creative and inspirational play experiences. And finally, human workers deserve economic support, acknowledgement, and protection as economic and technological landscapes change. We're here because ultimately we love games. We want to keep working, we want to keep pushing the boundaries of our field, and we want to access the tools that help us do that in new, compelling, and creative ways. We want to build beautiful worlds. We want to imagine. We want to explore. We want to tell stories and take full advantage of our birthrights as humans to play, dream, and create. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. My pleasure. <laughs> what a great start into the Gamescom Congress. And um, AI will be a topic for several talks today. You're, you're the first one. There will be more to follow. Um, 
I found it interesting um, that you talked about the different types of creativity. Um, do you think that AI maybe can invent its own form of creativity that maybe artificial intelligence will use a form of creativity that we don't know yet? You know? I think what AI can do will continue. We don't know what AI will be next week. <laughs> um, and especially if we do move towards models of self-aware AI, um, we certainly might see, see new models of creativity. But right now, uh, we just have the language with which we use to describe human creativity, and we're applying that to computation. Yeah. And do you think, if you imagine like 10 years from now, do, will we st still talk about, oh, what can I, I maybe do? Will we still be exploring or will we just be using? You know, I, th I think it depends. Uh, this is going to be really cynical. I think it depends on what people think can make money. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, yeah, I, I, I think so. And like, you know, obviously AI is a huge growth area. So I think we'll continue to be curious for a long time. I would be very surprised if we figure out everything there is to know. And hopefully we can also apply AI to do creative solutions for big global challenges like climate change. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you talk, I mean, when we talk about artificial intelligence, um, very quickly people talk about guidelines. You know, mm -hmm. oh, this has to be restricted. Um, what's your opinion on this? Do we have to have guidelines or sh should this be defined by higher authorities or can every company do it by itself? What do you think? So I come from the apocalyptic future, which <laughs> some of you might know as the United States of America. <laughs> And um, so specifically California. And so I've seen firsthand what happens when tech is allowed to run wild. And so that affects my bias and why I think that regulation is really important. However, are politicians technology experts? No. So what needs to happen is this needs to be like an informed coalition of technology leaders, policymakers, and actually experts across the public sector. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you see AI implemented in like artistic ways? Maybe we will see like forms of theater that implies AI or something like that. Do you Absolutely. So that project, Bad News, that I, I just explained, um, is, is definitely an example of algorithmically generated theater um, in which the script is new every time. And I think that kind of element of chaos and that element of improvisation that ha like instant generation provides um, is really dynamic and can be really entertaining. So absolutely, I think we're going to see more intersection between AI and artworks, which is why artists need to be active in the discussion around what I AI is and what it becomes. Same with game developers. So the discussion isn't exclusively shaped by industry. Mm. Do you know of any projects that brings, I mean, like when you talk about um, traditional art, like mm -hmm. theater and painting. Mostly people that are artists in this field, they are not digital people, mostly. Mm -hmm. So do you know of any projects that bring like the digital uh, world and the uh, art, traditional arts together? Yeah, so in the, my first slide, um, I showed an, an image of an artist um, called Suguen. And what Suguen does is she trained a robotic arm on the gestures that she makes while she's painting and drawing. So what she does is she'll set up sometimes multiple robots that she paints with. So it's a collaborative process that's her, but not completely her, because it's mimicked through the AI. But you're also doing this like very traditional image making process, which I think is, is really cool interplay. Yeah. I mean, we're still like physical bodies standing here on stage. Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> and we also have a very real audience. Uh, oh, by the way, I forgot. I have a microphone here. So if anyone of you has a question for Sarah, feel free to ask. Look, I got a microphone. Is there, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, there. Wait, I come to you. Startup. Sure. And uh, I wanted to discuss with you uh, an affirmation you made about um, AI is bad at knowing what is fun. Yeah. Because uh, I think a very interesting point that we saw in the last months, because things go really fast, is that uh, uh, techniques, new techniques such as Reinforcement learning with human feedback mm -hmm. allows you to 
make the machine knows what is fun and to train models with that. And you tell that uh, it's hard to define fun and it's ho the whole point of these techniques. You don't have to define it, you just have to learn it. Well, I think I would argue, so we, I, we talked about subjective, and su the, the role of subjectivity that is played in both fun and creativity, right? So I think that's absolutely very interesting work. However, it is early. And so the amount of people you're training that model on, um, I would be really hesitant to believe that's an accurate sample size that can cover the range of humor globally. Um, I'm not saying we can't get there, but also, so like, you would probably know that humor in France uh, and even different regions of France might be different than certain types of jokes like in the Nordics, right? So different types of senses of humor are not universal. So yes, we might have an AI that is pretty good at understanding what an individual person that it's trained on thinks is funny, but I don't think we're in a place where we can some, like have it writing sitcoms. But thank you for that question. Any more questions? The lights are so blinding, I think, ah, it's over there. <laughs> it's a problem when you stand on stage, you don't see anything. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Annika, I'm a video game translator, and of course me and a lot of my colleagues are a bit nervous when it comes uh -huh. to AI and machine translation. So, um, what is your take on that, like, in the field of localization and video game translation? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned unions, and I think that workers are powerful when they come together. So um, I know it can be a kind of scary conversation to have with your colleagues, but I think it might be a, a meaningful one to kind of come together ba around that concern that you have. Um, and also, again, like coming back to the nature of subjectivity, you know that when you're doing localization and translation, it's not always one-to-one, -one, right? And so there's always gonna be nuance there, and that, at least not right now, the AI is not capable of picking up. So yeah, I absolutely believe you're bringing so much value to the work. But yeah, I completely understand the concern. I mean, we have seen automatic translation for years now mm -hmm. in games. Uh, mostly you see them at like bad mobile games when you have really, really crappy German and you know, oh, okay, that was a robot. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I believe that we have been there and we know what bad translation is and it's probably not going any better, right? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it might, um, which, you know, is scary, right? yeah. especially if that's your job. But, um, you know, you're, we'll, we'll see. I mean, we, I wouldn't be surprised if we're able to train data sets on a particular location, right? Yeah. Um, and so to have, have that particular location influence um, the machine. Yeah. By the way, when you talk about um, fun and humor, mm -hmm. um, maybe some of you know The Dark Tower by Stephen King, and at one part there is, they are on board on a train which has artificial intelligence, oh. and the train captures the protagonist and says, I only let you free if you tell uh, riddles, you know, um, <laughs> that I can, I, I can solve any riddle. Mm -hmm. And then they start telling, you know, that non-joke riddles, and yeah. you don't have really a solution for that, and then when the whole thing crashes. So okay. you can't trick AI. <laughs> any more questions? I saw here, yeah. young man in front. <laughs> Uh, do you think that the AI gets um, less intelligence because of uh, using its own translation or information? Well, I, I, will, I will say when it's trained on real people, especially social media, uh-huh. <laughs> like, I, I think about specifically about that Microsoft bot, Tay, that was trained on um, Twitter, and that immediately, like, in a very short period of time, it was like, we got to build that wall. And I was like, oh, no, Tay, <laughs> this is not what we want. So absolutely, we, that, that is a, a major concern. Someone else? Okay, we'll, when we look at the watch, we also have to come to an end, unfortunately, Sarah. But thank you so much. That was yeah. so nice thank to hear you. you. Thank you.